Hello and welcome to this fascinating interview with Dr. Ivan Meisner. We're on the topic of thriving post lockdown, but in case you're not sure exactly who Ivan Meisner is, let me tell you. He's the founder and chief visionary officer of BNI, the world's largest business networking organization. Founded in 1985, the organization now has over 10,000 chapters throughout every populated continent of the world and practically every country. Last year alone, BNI generated over 11 million referrals, resulting in over $16 billion worth of business for its members. Dr. Meisner's PhD is from the University of Southern California. He's a New York Times bestselling author who has written 26 books, including one of his latest, Who's in Your Room? He is also a com columnist for entrepreneur.com. He's been a university professor as well as a member of the board of trustees for the University of Laverne. He is called the father of modern networking by both Forbes and CNN. He's considered to be one of the world's leading experts on business networking. He's been a keynote speaker for major corporations and associations around the world. He's been featured in the LA Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, as well as, numer as, well as numerous TV and radio shows, including CNN, the BBC, and the Today Show. Among his many awards, he's been named Humanitarian of the Year by the Red Cross, and he has been the recipient of the John C. Maxwell Leadership Award. And with his late wife, Beth, he is the co-founder of the BNI Charitable Foundation. And he is also on the board of directors of Transformational Leadership Council. We served on that board together for over 10 years. And by the way, in his spare time, he's an amateur magician and a black belt in karate. So we need to be very polite to you. And Thank you. No, no problem at all, because personally, I deeply admire Dr. Meisner as a, like a really senior soul, someone who has a deep overview and a deep understanding. When we had issues in Transformational Leadership Council on the board, we all just instinctively turn to Ivan and say, well, what do you think? Because we admire him so deeply. But what's relevant now, the reason, thank Wait, you. Can I, can I just interrupt you? Because I, I want to I wanna edify you a bit here. Uh, thank you so much for what you said. I really appreciate that. But listen, you are an amazing coach. And uh, I, I can say firsthand, I've witnessed, I've witnessed your events. I've been at one of your events. And more importantly, uh, Elizabeth, my late wife, uh, was trying to do a book for I don't know, how long was it? Eight years? Ten years? Yes. She had this idea, and she struggled with it for almost a decade. She went to your program, your book writing program, and in like three months, boom, did the book. It was published. Uh, it, it, it has done well, and um, that's all because of what you did. And I, I got to tell you, getting that book out was probably one of the best things that happened to her throughout her illness. And I just want to thank you personally for truly making her feel incredible. Well, I'm uh, crying now, by the way, but I am so grateful that she got the book done before she passed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate that. So now, now that the crying's all done, <laughs> for, me too. <laughs> So the reason that I've chosen Dr. Meisner is that he has so many chapters around the world, 10,000 chapters, and each chapter has roughly 18 or 20 entrepreneurs. Uh, the statistical means 27. 27. Yeah. So and, and the highest is we now have a chapter of 200 members, one group. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I know. Didn't think it was possible. So when you multiply that out, you get hundreds of thousands of small entrepreneurs that Dr. Meisner is deeply connected with. And so he understands from his own personal experience what's going on, not just for small entrepreneurs near his home or something like that, but for small entrepreneurs around the world. And I've chosen him amongst all of the very famous friends that I have because I want to tap into his knowledge of what's going on, 
how has the lockdown affected entrepreneurs and how have they been successful or unsuccessful in pivoting? Like, is it just a few success stories that makes us uh, excited or is it most people who are able to pivot or most people going downhill and what's gonna happen afterwards? So that's the general topic. Let's talk about now. Right now, are most entrepreneurs pivoting and being successful or are they mostly failing? Well, I don't know if it's mostly failing, but I think way too many are failing. Uh, and they're failing for, I think, a, a number of reasons. And my, the, what I believe the reasons are are different than what they probably believe the reasons are. They're going to point to COVID and say, that's the reason I'm failing. But I think that uh, the truth is they lost hope. And when they lost hope, um, everything else fell apart. Uh, I, I think the way we position everything in life makes a world of difference. Uh, I have never called the, uh, the, the COVID experience lockdown or quarantine. To me, it is the great pause. Ah. The world had to come, you know, the, the, the pause button was hit on the entire world. And, um, and we had to figure out what to do with that. And I truly believe that hope is more powerful than fear. And we live in a world of fear. And what I have discovered through all the recessions I've been through, and BNI has been through, this, was, this is the fourth recession that we've gone through, um, is that business people either get focused by fear or they get frozen by fear. And so to answer your question, everyone who got frozen by fear either is out of business or struggling. Those people who got focused by fear have survived and many have thrived. You said it in the opening. We did 11 million referrals last year. We generated 16 billion US dollars in what we call thank you for closed business. That's how much business was passed back and forth. 16 billion during COVID. Oh my goodness. That's just, by the way, $16 billion is more is more than twice as much as the gross domestic product for the country of Liechtenstein. <laughs> I know it's a small country, but still, you know, it's pretty cool that we generated as much business as a small nation. I'm looking for a bigger nation eventually, but um, I still think that's pretty cool. But I think, it's, I think that it begins with having hope. It's, it begins with how we position ourselves in, in the challenges that we have. I think it then, be, then requires having a plan and taking action. Hope plus a plan plus action. That's the way you get through disruption. And oh, by the way, this will not be the last disruption that we have mm -hmm. in the world, you know, or that you have as a business, that we all have as a business. There will be more and more disruption as time goes on. So there are people who, when a problem happens, they keep their hope. They are open to possibilities. They they partner or they schmooze with other people who are positive and who have interesting ideas and say, what can we do about this? And then they come up with ideas because they're looking for them. And the other people that you call the frozen people just yep. catatonic and their business fails, even if they could have done something because they just feel hopeless. They got frozen. And one of the things I've been telling people for the last years, micro dose the news. Yes. Uh, especially in the beginning of COVID, I had friends that were just obsessed with the news. Yes. And, you know, if, if, if you watch the news, and by the way, I, you know, I, I think it's probably a little bit better in Canada than it is in the United States, but they, they shouldn't call them news channels. They're opinion channels, posing as news channels. Yes. Channels. Most, most, I mean, it's not like the old days where you'd have in, in the US, Walter Cronkite, who would read the news. And if he had an opinion, there'd be something across the bottom of the screen, you know, that says, this is not the opinion of the station, but of the you know, commentator. Um, those days are long gone. And so what happens is you watch the news and they're just filling your head. And what, what sells in the news? Negative news. It's negative that gets people riled up. And so I, I have said for a long time, microdose the news. I get all, almost all my news. I don't watch the news channels anymore. I get almost all my news on an app. 
And, and, and I'll watch a right wing, uh, or I'll read a right wing, you know, conservative uh, news app. And then I read the left wing conservative news app, right? opinion apps. And I figured the truth is somewhere, somewhere in between, but I microdose it. So I'm not putting in my head Yes. All the negativity that is out there. And I, I, I know that took a while to explain, but I think that's important if you want to break through the, the, you know, being frozen in fear. And then you're in a position where you can actually have hope, create a plan and take action. I've done something a little more general, uh, like a uh, bigger than you just suggested. Many years ago, when I was a young entrepreneur, I'd come home, I was single, I'd make my dinner and I'd watch TV over dinner. And then it was one in the morning. <laughs> what happened? And I realized that the television was far smarter than me in getting me addicted to the next half hour show. And I'll just watch a minute of it. And suddenly it was the half hour and they get <laughs> me into the next show. And it's one in the morning and I couldn't stop it. I wasn't strong enough to overcome how clever they are. Yeah. And when I noticed what the content was, it was sitcoms that are silly or put downs and it was news that was negative. And so I took the drastic step of getting rid of my television because I had no immunity to it. They were, just, oh. they were just smarter than me. And so I'm, I don't know, probably the wealthiest Canadian who doesn't have a television. <laughs> I'm so grateful. I mean, I do watch Netflix movies on my laptop, yeah. but I'm free of all that crap. Yep. And the proof that mo that the news isn't that important or opinions, as you say, aren't that important is that two days later, you forget them. It's not, yep. it's not important in the sense that you need to remember it. It's just daily crap. It, it is. And, it, and, and like I said, it, you know, it's such a left leaning or right leaning um, station that if it, it just winds you up, gets yes. you angry and boom, sends you out with these beliefs, which are other people's opinions. Because it's, you know, if you watch the two stations or read the two apps like I do, you'll see the same opinion, the same opinion be 180 degrees apart from each other. Yes. And, and, and that's why I tend to read both because I figure the truth is somewhere in between. And, and, and if you're just reading one or watching one, it's just gonna wind you up and send you out. Yes, it's like being a marriage counselor and hearing the husband's story and hearing the wife's story of the same incident. Completely yeah. different. That's a, that is a fantastic example. One which I experienced, by the way, just I think most, most uh, long-term married couples probably have. Yes. So one way is to stay away from the news and negative opinions in order to keep your hope up. Or at and, least microdose it. Yeah. Yes. But... So you're saying that more, more companies than should or way more than you want are suffering. Yes. Now, I know that when you get a shock wave, the first thing is suffer. Yep. Okay, I get that. But then you have to recover and be creative and look around and figure out what to do. And there are so many powerful stories. Yep. I got a few I'll share when you're ready. Jack Canfield uh, shared a story, our mutual friend, of a client of his who ran the largest gym in Los Angeles, and he had huge rent, like a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, and he was collecting $20 a month from many, many clients. And then the lockdown happened, and he wondered what to do, because he's used to going to the gym 15 hours a day, seven days a week, because someone has to take care of his giant asset. And he didn't know how it would ever end. And he was making money, but he was didn't know how he could ever retire. Yeah. He, he just wasn't sure. Anyways, the lockdown came, everybody canceled their $20 a month. He still had his couple hundred thousand dollars a month rent going out. And he panicked. And he and I don't know how Jack found out about it. Maybe Jack coached him. But what he did was he contacted one of his clients and said, hello, Bill, I know that you like the stair climber. I've disinfected it. I put it on a truck and it's on its way to your home for only $99 a month. If you don't want it, I'll send it to someone who wants it. Everybody grabbed it. 
Really? So he's now the largest gym in Los Angeles that doesn't exist. He has no rent. He doesn't go to the gym 15 hours a day. He has a thousand pieces of equipment that he owns out on loan to people's homes. And he runs his home from his, his business from his cell phone. He's making more money with no overhead and doesn't work 15 hours a day. He is so grateful. I mean, isn't that, be, that is the, a, I love that story. That is a great example of being focused by fear instead of being frozen by fear. He responded quickly enough to make a difference in the market. And um, he came up with a brilliant idea. I would have never thought of that. But here's what I love about it. It's only because of the lockdown that he was forced to come up with that idea. Mm -hmm. Ivan, you and I know that he could have implemented that anytime. anytime. Yeah. But he was forced to come up with it. And so there's so many people like me who are grateful for it because it's forced me. Here's something I don't know. I have not told you this. Let's think about this. For 38 years, I called myself a professional speaker. And when the lockdown came, I realized it wasn't true. Here's why. I might get a speaking gig in Slovenia. It takes me a day to get there. And then I have to recover for a day for the time zone and jet lag. Then on the third day, I give my speech. Then I got two days to get back. So it's, it's a five day trip. Yeah. I wasn't a professional speaker for 38 years. I was a professional traveler. <laughs> I was traveling for five days and speaking for 90 minutes. Oh, I get it. But, but now with the lockdown, I can have dinner with my wife and say, oh, excuse me, I've got to give a speech in Slovenia. Yeah. Walk into my office, give the speech. A 90 minute speech takes me 90 minutes now, not five days. Right. Right. And so I can give far more speeches. Do you know how many times in 38 years I would get multiple, um, multiple invitations to speak in different countries, different cities, and I have to turn them down. Right. Now I can speak in Slovenia, Singapore, Chicago in the same weekend Yeah. and still be at home. And it's that kind of pivoting that really makes a huge difference. And to be honest with you, BNI exists because I had to pivot. I had lost a big client. Uh, I was a management consultant. I did uh, work with the hiring, training, evaluating employees, personal policy procedure manuals, strategic plans. And I lost a, a really big client that I th thought would renew, but I didn't know they were having financial problems because I wasn't involved in their finances. So they didn't renew my contract. And I'm like, oh man, what am I gonna do? I just lost, and I had just bought a house. Right? <laughs> and the, you know, the mortgage felt this big. I had a brand new house and I lost my biggest client, which was over 50% of my revenue, close to 50% of my revenue. And so I, um, I was like, wow, I'm in trouble. What am I gonna do? Well, I get all my business through referrals and speaking engagements. So I increased the number of speaking engagements I did. And I started a BNI group. And, you know, Raymond, I'd like to tell you I had this vision of an international organization, but I just wanted one group, my friends who would refer me and I would refer them and look what it turned into. It turned into something so big, I had to sell my consulting practice and, and you know, now I have been doing BNI full time for 36 years. Wow. So it's, so about, it's about being focused by your fear, not, not frozen by it. So that's during the lockdown. There are some businesses world famous, the most loved company in the entire world, Disney, is down in sales 91%. Yeah. That's like if a person earns $100,000 a year, the next year they earn 9,000. Like yeah. that's an insane drop. There are companies world famous like Hertz Rent-A-Car that have gone bankrupt and JC Penney's gone bankrupt. The iconic uh, Starbucks, is not reopening 25% of its stores. Victoria's Secret is not opening 25% of its stores. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> a, re a recent a survey amongst American restaurateurs, they found that 40% are not reopening. 40%, they haven't gone bankrupt. They're just not going back to work. Yeah. They're just not paying their rent and the landlord's not insisting on it. Yeah. And the larger the company, that. the easier it is for that to happen. Uh, although I think there are many things that you can do to pivot. 
uh, BNI, you know, we're not we're not as large as most of those companies. You know, as a matter of fact, we're probably not as large as any of those companies, but we're a pretty large company, certainly in terms of footprint. And we had we started the the, the COVID virus with about nine thousand seven hundred chapters. We transitioned ninety seven hundred chapters, nine thousand seven hundred groups that met in person every week. We transitioned 9,700 chapters from in-person to online in just weeks. Uh, luckily, I had a, luckily, I have a CEO, Graham Weimiller, who, man, he was looking around a corner because in January of, of uh, 2020, he called me and he said, hey, uh, as a matter of fact, it was just after our TLC meeting uh, in 2020. He said, hey, um, I, I, this COVID thing is going to be really big. And, and I, I said to him, Raymond, Ah, it's just another virus. Don't worry about it. He's like, no, no, this is really going to be big. I am so thankful he didn't listen to me. Right. He flipped China in January of 2020 to online. He flipped Italy in February because that's the other hotspot. Then he, at the end of February, he flipped most of Europe. And by March, he flipped the entire world. We now have 10,062 chapters. Wow. So since COVID, we've opened over 350 groups. And you've also opened 10,000 Zoom accounts. Uh, yeah, Zoom likes us. <laughs> we did, you're exactly right. We opened 10,000 Zoom accounts. Yeah. So, so uh, it, that's part of being able to pivot. Even if you're a yeah. large organization, sometimes, there, I mean, I don't know how Disney could have pivoted, but um, I, I, sometimes it's possible to pivot even as a larger company. I'll give you an example. One of the largest organizations in Canada is Canada Post, the post office for Canada. And they just sent an email to me. I don't know how they got my email address, but they somehow have the email address of every single Canadian announcing that they're going to send a postcard to us prepaid. And we can write a, a postcard to anyone in Canada that we love and mail it for free. And it's just to make Canadians feel good and to connect with loved ones in oh, this nice. time of distancing. Nice. And because of that, I, I said to myself, darn it, I'm gonna send out more letters instead yeah. of just email. Yeah, so it they makes a much it. bigger personal impact. And this is not just a large corporation, this is a government organization. Which is really surprising. You could, as a little guy, you can pivot as yeah. a huge corporation, you can pivot. And as a huge government organization, you can pivot. Yeah. Would you like to hear a couple of stories uh, from uh, some BNI members that made miraculous pivots? Oh my gosh. So yes. here's two. The first was in California, the second's in Australia. Um, in California, US, there was a person in March of last year that um, was a furniture reupholstery shop not exactly an essential business. And um, she had to close down her shop and she furloughed all of her employees because they could no longer go to the shop. And um, she did a one-to-one. -one. Now, earlier you said you have to have the right mindset and then you have to do something or words to that effect. And that's absolutely correct. And one of the things that I was telling people to do is do one-to-ones talk to people, even if it's online, you know, when tough, when times are tough, you need your network more than ever. Your network is a beacon of hope in a sea of fear. And so do one-to-ones with people. And so she did, she did a one-to-one -one with another member. And he offhandedly, he said, you, you have a lot of cloth, a lot of material, don't you? And she said, I literally have tons of cloth. Of course. And he said, have you thought about making COVID masks? Now, this was March of last year. Oh, I don't know what it was like where you live, but I'm telling you, masks, you just couldn't get them. Right. They, you they were completely sold out. Yes. So she made a hundred of them, Raymond, a hundred masks. And she gave uh, 50 of, she gave, she gave all 100 away. She gave two at a time. And she gave them to all of her BNI members and a few other people. And she gave two and her business card. And she said, um, I'm giving you two masks, one's for you. Would you please take the other one along with my card 
and give it to a doctor, a hospital, a senior center, a nurse, oh. anyone in the medical profession and oh. tell them, I can produce those for them in a week. If they want them, they call me, I can give them the prices. Raymond, she went from almost bankruptcy to hiring all of her employees back. Physically distanced them. I remember it's mindset. I hate the term socially distanced because we should be more social than ever. Physically distanced everyone. And she hired them all back and her business changed at least during COVID. Uh, but she was able to not only survive but thrive because she became a COVID mask manufacturing business which was an essential business. So uh, that's one story. The other one's quicker. It was a brewery in Australia. Okay. And of course, all the bars were closed. And this, he, he happened to, he was a BNI member and he happened to do a one-to-one -one with a member. And the member said, you have a lot of alcohol, don't you? And he said, I literally have vats of, of alcohol. He said, have you thought about becoming a COVID hand sanitizer business? And the guy said, oh my goodness, no. He said, you could make hand sanitizer with alcohol and hire everybody back. And that's what he did. And it's he, the same alcohol as in hand sanitizer? Yeah, hand sanitizer. Most hand sanitizer has some level of alcohol in it. Yeah. Yeah. But the same alcohol as is in beer. Like it's the same thing. Well, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's distilled differently, you know, but okay. yeah, there's alcohol. I mean, Everclear is alcohol. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. So, um, so he, he basically, you know, transitioned to becoming a COVID hand sanitizer business until some of the bars started opening up again and, you know, he's brewing beer again. But uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's that kind of mindset of pivoting when things seem to be completely lost. Can I share a story with you that yes, you please. will laugh out loud? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Collingwood, Ontario is a small tourist town near Toronto there is a boutique art gallery in Collingwood that was about to go under because the last thing you need when you're worried about losing your income is buying art. Yeah. And in any case, the store had to be closed because art is not an essential service. Yeah. She noticed that people on Zoom had lousy backgrounds. And so she announced that she's selling, wait for it, COVID art. COVID art, people stream to her store from Toronto. She's doing more business than she's ever done before. That is amazing. And of course the art probably is inexpensive to do. I, I mean, I'm assuming it's a print of the actual art. So it's inexpensive, but you, you multiply your market by a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Yeah. And so would, you know, less money times a thousand is a lot of money. Now, you have a fascinating vision of what the new world is going to look like after COVID. Mm -hmm. There's no one that is espousing this opinion but you. I've interviewed so many people. I want you to lay it on us for my listeners right now. All right, I will. I take on, as you said when we spoke, a contrarian view. Yeah. But I do think, I do think there will be some changes. So let me get to that so people don't think I'm a complete crazy person. I think in many ways, probably in most ways, we're gonna go right back to where we were. Pretty quickly, not immediately, but pretty quickly. And here's, here's my basis for that. After the Spanish flu, where I believe many more people died than have died through COVID, we went right back to doing things the way we did them. Maybe not in the first year, but certainly years later, no question about it, decades later. And I think in many ways, we're going to go right back to doing the same things, both smart and stupid. We're going to go right back to it. And, um, and I know that's contrarian. I, I, you know, I'd like to believe that we're all going to be completely different. And you know, we've learned how to pivot, so now we can pivot more. No, I'm not, I don't know. We'll see. I think people get um, complacent with time. And that's why I believe we'll probably go right back to it. Now, there are a few exceptions. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle in terms of remote working. Yes. Uh, I think we will go back to in person and to some extent, but I think it's gonna be a hybrid. 
which means I would not want to own a lot of large commercial office space. Exactly. I think that's going to be problematic. Uh, but look, I own a lot of commercial buildings. I don't own large uh, commercial office space, thank goodness. But I, I, think the, I think the retail will come back and I think a professional space, most of what I have is medical professional space and a, 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 pizza, a pizza parlor, you know? And I, so I think those will all come, well, actually the, the pizza parlor delivered. So they did really well <laughs> during COVID. Um, so I, I think, you know, businesses will, 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 will come back, but I, I think there'll be changes. I think we're gonna have a hybrid. BNI, the ge genie's out of the bottle. You know, we have 10,060 groups that are all meeting online still, or almost all meeting online. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a hybrid where, you know, maybe three weeks a month they're on Zoom and one week a month they're in person. Uh, the low hanging fruit will be in Canada and uh, Northern US, snow days. I don't know what you call them in Canada, but in the US, when the school is closed because of snow, they call it a snow day. And um, what happened in BNI is if a school had a snow day and was closed, the chapter would not meet. But if the schools were open, they figured it was okay, you should be able to go to a meeting. And so I see immediately in, the, in, in any country that's got a lot of snow that it'll absolutely be a hybrid. On a day when the schools are closed, we'll meet by Zoom, we'll meet by BNI online. And well, on the um, board of directors of Transformational Leadership Council we were we uh, we usually meet twice a year for about five days. We've been doing that for almost twenty years, yeah. and now we were talking about one meeting being by Zoom and another meeting being in person at some exotic location. Yeah, I love that idea. It's, but why right. didn't we think of that before? Why did we need a lockdown? Why did we need a worldwide pandemic? Well, I, I, I think I know why. Um, it was online meetings just weren't embraced at that time. And I, very few people had Zoom. I didn't have Zoom. I didn't, I used Skype and I still use Skype, but I didn't have Zoom. And um, uh, my wife was smarter than I, she, she did have Zoom. Uh, so uh, I think people just weren't used to it. And now they're, now they have Zoom fatigue. They're so used to it. But uh, I think, and to me, you know, I get members who complain about Zoom fatigue. Oh, I want to meet in person. You know, I'm tired of Zoom. Okay. Networking events are considered by medical professionals potential super spreader events. Right. I've re read articles from medical professionals. So we can meet in person. Somebody catches COVID and dies. Or you can have Zoom fatigue. <laughs> Uh, you know, seems pretty obvious to me, you know, buck up buttercup. <laughs> Let's deal with the Zoom fatigue so nobody catches COVID and dies. So um, I, I, think, I think that um, we're likely to go right back to doing a lot of the dumb things that we may have done before. Uh, but there are some things that will change like office space and, and remote meetings. Business travel will be reduced. Yeah. For probably a long time, uh, if not permanently. Uh, personal travel, however, I don't think it'll hurt personal travel. I think we'll go right back to personal travel. Maybe not the first year, but let me tell you something. Um, I plan. I plan on a couple of big trips. I yeah. I may be going to the Antarctic. Uh, well, late this I, year. It's my best trip ever. Is the Antarctic? Yeah. My best ever. I, I am literally. When we hang up from this, I'm gonna book my my trip to the Antarctic. I'm gonna see a solar eclipse. In the wow. Antarctic, yeah. It's my favorite trip. So what you've said is during the lockdown, you need to be focused on hope and not consumed by fear. Keep your watching of news, which is really just negative opinions down to a minimum. Schmooze with people who are positive and eager and looking at pivoting. And for the future, it unfortunately, except for some changes like Zoom and reduce travel is going to be pretty much like it was before because people don't learn and they go yeah. back to their old habits. I, and I think you'll see masks for uh, a long while uh, and they'll slowly, you know, a few years from now, people will mostly be dropping them even during travel. 
I think we'll go back to our old habits. That's my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's kind of what my crystal ball says. One reframing I would make, I, I agree with everything you said. That was a perfect summary. One reframing is rather than schmooze, I, I believe networking is a little different than schmoozing. Networking is about taking off your bib and putting on an apron. It's about serving people. And, and if you really do it right, you're talking to people and you're asking them, how can I help you? What can I do for you? How many times, Raymond, have I said to you at a TLC meeting, how can I help you? What do you need promoted? That's what networking's about. And so when you, when you do these one-to-ones, even if they're by Zoom, it should be this, you know, how are you doing? Are you okay? Uh, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And to me, that goes way beyond schmoozing. That's about giving. It's about helping other people. And, and as you know, we have in BNI this philosophy of giver's gain. And I really believe that giver's gain is, is more than a phrase. It's a way of living one's life. It's a perspective to view and interact with the world. It's an attitude, not an expectation. And when it's applied properly, it'll change your life. And when it changes enough lives, it'll change the world. Here, here. So this is not just one man's opinion. This is one man's opinion learned from being in deep contact with 100,000 entrepreneurs. 276,514 as of this morning. I get a daily report. How can someone join BNI if they wish to? Oh, go to bni.com and find uh, a, a chapter near you. We, you. You need to still be geographic because we will be going back to in-person meetings. It might be a hybrid. So join a, a local chapter near you, go to bni.com and there's a section on finding a chapter uh, near you. Anyone that's uh, interested, I have a blog, ivanmeisner.com, all free content up there. I've been blogging since 2007, twice a week. There's a lot there. Ivan, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I'm really grateful that I know you and that we're friends. And thank you for taking this time to explain what you feel is going on now and what will go on post lockdown. Thank you, Raymond. I love working with you. And um, when we get off uh, this interview, uh, I'm going to ask you, what can I do for you? And I'm going to tell you about Antarctica. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot for having me on, Raymond. Thank you. Bye-bye.